Well, good morning. So I got to tell you a story in a minute about a McFlurry. Actually, what's it called again? Mc... It's not, no, no. What's it? What's it? What? McFlurby. I got to tell you about the McFlurby. It's a long story. So we had baptism last night. It was awesome. We got to baptize two folks last night. We baptized another one just a week before that. We got more baptisms coming up at the beach. If you want to be baptized at the beach or be a part of it, Let us know. We're going to buy your pass, unless you already have a pass, but we have to actually reserve places. Jetty Park is um, requiring us to do that. So anyway, so we're going to do that and make sure it's awesome. So Rodney, thanks for sharing this morning. We really appreciate you. Steve uh, is doing a great job. Got the A-team active. If you want to sign up for that, that's in the back. Some great things going on. And today we're starting the book of James. So let me give you the key verse from the book of James, chapter 2. Verse 26, as the body without the spirit is dead, so faith without deeds is dead. So let me just give you a little background. This verse is not saying that you do deeds and it helps you to become a Christian. It's basically saying if you're a Christian, there will be deeds in your life. If you're an orange tree, then oranges are natural. If there aren't oranges, then the problem is not that you're not a tree. The problem is with what? Fertilizer, water, sun, insects, you know. So the truth is for all of us, if we're not careful, we can go through life and we can start out plugged into the vine, which is what Jesus talks about. But if we're not careful, we'll begin to just go through the motions of Christianity. We'll just start doing what we've always done not really think about it, and instead of plugging in through the scripture, instead of plugging in through times of prayer and getting still before God, we'll just start doing things and thinking that that's what makes us good people. You're missing it. Fruit is a natural part of real trees. This tree, this bush, this flower will not change. It's going to be this way. It might have more dust on it a year from now. But it's going to look just like this. If you're a Christian, my hope for you is as we do this series, as you go out of your way to grow in Christ, that next year you can look back and see some areas of growth in your life. And with that in mind, I want us to talk today about three ways to cultivate, three ways to cultivate your identity. So uh, the reason I showed that clip is I watched a movie and that's got the dad from Good Times. So when I saw the advertisement... Number one, I thought, I didn't know he was still alive. Number two is, if you don't know this, I watched Good Times as a child, however often it came on. Dynamite, right? But I loved the dad, and I'll never forget, it was like my first TV trauma when the dad died. Come to find out later, it was the mom in the show that wanted him off the show, but that's another story for another day, but... I always loved him. He was one of my favorite characters and just something about him, even the way he talked and dealt with his kids. Just, you know, as a kid, it was like, wow, it was really neat. So they make this new movie. I have to watch it. I'll, I'll tell you it's about a five out of ten, but uh, uh, I would love to tell you five out of five. But uh, you might like it better than I did, or you might not want to watch it. That's fine with me, but I want to tell you what happened. So during it, The dad, the whole time, he basically does a knockoff of everything from McDonald's. And so he creates something called the McFlurby to mock the McFlurry. But the weird part is what happened to me, and this is how temptation works. That's the reason I'm pointing it out to you. I'll talk about this a little bit more in this message. I have never, ever had a McFlurry Ever. I'm watching this movie. They're doing a knockoff name of the McFlurby. They're calling it the McFlurby. And all of a sudden, I want a McFlurry. I'm watching it and I start thinking, wow, I wonder what a McFlurry tastes. They made it sound really good, even though they weren't selling even McFlurry. It was enough to plant the seed in the garden of my mind that then I continued to water. And fertilize, because I said, I wonder if that's good. And then I would pass a McDonald's and go, you know, I've never tried a McFlurry. I'll have to try it. And so a few days later, I'm driving past a McDonald's and I think, I'm going to get me a McFlurry. 
I pull into McDonald's, I get the McFlurry. I think I got a cookies and cream. Did I get a cookies and cream one? And I got it. Man, I was so excited. And I started eating it. And it's not that good. Just not that good. Uh, much, Dairy Queen's much better. But it was funny. In my mind, I had built it up. And then I was disappointed. That's exactly what temptation is like. You, you get a thought planted in your mind. And we're going to talk specifically in a minute how the enemy can cultivate and you help him to cultivate things in your life you don't want there. And so I'm going to give you three ways that you can cultivate what God wants in your life. Do you ever feel the pressure of life on you? You ever actually feel it? Feel it in your neck? Feel it in your shoulders? You feel that weight of a decision you have to make? Maybe somebody you're dealing with? You ever wake up in the middle of the night bothered by something? You know, too often we focus on our circumstances. Or we focus on our finances. Or we focus on our desire instead of God's strength and eternity. So today I want to talk about how we can do that and change our focus. So number one, dwell on results, not circumstance. We're going to pick up James chapter 1, verse 2. Verse 1, James says he's a bondservant. Let me tell you a little more, more about James real quick. James is Jesus' half-brother. His mom and dad are Joseph and Mary. And uh, so Jesus uh, is, grows up with James. I'm sure James... Uh, I, you know, I wonder if Jesus did miracles as a child. Wouldn't that be frustrating? You know, mom's like, we're out of wine at home. Apparently, she, he had done that before, by the way, because when they ran out of wine for Jesus' first miracle, you know what Mary says? Go get my son. He can help you out. So I'm guessing at home one day, he's bringing water to the table, and all of a sudden, he says, God bless it, and puts it down, and there's wine on the table. I mean, that had to happen. Some, can you imagine being the brother of that guy? You think your brother was perfect, right? So, you know, why can't you be more like Jesus, right? But I'll tell you this too. At one point, the family came to get Jesus. Many people think they came because they were coming to take him away. Ha, ha, ho, ho, he, he, to the funny farm where life is beautiful all the time, right? They, they thought he was crazy, so they were coming to get him. That's when Jesus says, who are my mother and my brothers? That's a nice way to treat your family. But listen to what James says, because now he is a follower of of Christ. This may be the first book of the Bible that we have, the New Testament, that was written. We don't know that for sure, but we're pretty sure because of some of the context. It starts out, verse 2, consider it pure joy. That means in the Greek, whole joy, my brothers and sisters, whenever you face trials of many kinds. You know why he says trials of many kinds? Because you have trials of many kinds. I would love to tell you that you only have certain trials. Like you'll deal with A and somebody else will deal with it. No, no. You're going to have many kinds of trials. Isn't that just, you know what the Bible says? Count that joy. And that word, count that, also can mean be a leader in joy. It's a really neat word. It can mean be a leader and it can mean to take account. And so, it, you know, it's the idea of lead out in joy. My brothers and sisters, whenever you face trials of many kinds, why? Because you know that the testing of your faith produces perseverance. I'm switching my glasses so I can read this. Let perseverance finish its work. Why? So you may be mature, complete, not lacking anything. How many of you would like to not lack anything? Wouldn't that be awesome if you don't lack anything? You just had everything. Like you just think of it and you have it. Well, how does that work? We're going to talk about that. If any of you lacks wisdom, anybody in here ever feel like they lack wisdom? Yeah, I hope you pray that for your pastor. All the, Oh, Lord, give him wisdom. Oh. Some people are on their knees every Sunday morning. Lord, I don't know how you use this man, but, right? If any of you lacks wisdom, what you should do, ask God. Who gives, I love this, generously to all without finding fault. Which means no matter how messed up you are when you pray for wisdom, if you pray in faith, God will give you wisdom. And then it continues, and it will be given to you. But when you ask, you must believe and not doubt. Why? Because the one who doubts is like a wave of the sea blown and tossed by the wind. That person shouldn't expect to receive anything from the Lord. Such a person is double-minded. That's the idea of having two tracks, double-minded and unstable in all they do. Now, let me tell you what happens in our lives all the time. The truth is, for all of us, for all of us, we love pleasure and we hate pain. The hard part for us is there are things we know we should do. 
and there's things we know we should not do. For example, we know. Let me give you a real simple one. We know we should exercise. Okay? Everybody. There's nobody in this room that says, nope, I think that's dumb. That's ridiculous. You shouldn't. No, no. We all know we should do something. Some more than others, but we should do something. We all know that. But it's painful to exercise. Now, there are a few people who like to run. Okay? Let me tell you what I call those people. Crazy people. Okay? But other than uh, uh, Rodney Walker who likes to run. There's not a whole, most people when they run, if you ever watch me run, you would wonder, is he going to be okay? That would be your thought. I've had people actually say that. Are you okay? I've had people stop. I've had old people in golf carts pull over and say, are you okay? And I'm thinking, I look worse than you right now. But why do I continue to do that? Why do I continue to move? Why do I continue to get up early? Why do I continue to work out? Because I know the long-term results. Bigger than any physical exercise is spiritual exercise. Trusting God in the middle of trial. Choosing the spirit rather than the flesh. Listen, when I met with this couple before they got married yesterday, one of the things I said to them is I said, listen, everybody thinks of the big things in marriage, the big fight, the big trip, the the big events, the vacation. I said, but the truth is, it is thousands and thousands and thousands of little choices. Will you say that good thing instead of that negative thing? Will you be grateful or will you be ungrateful all the time? Will you give thanks for your spouse? I said to them, I hope you wake up in the morning and think, I'm so grateful to have them. God, thank you that I could have them. Every day, we all have those choices. And if you want to make a relationship better, you invest wisely. Listen, if you want to make your relationship with God, if you want to help your faith to grow, it's based on the fact that as you go through trials and struggles, yes, you're going to struggle. Yes, you're going to fall, but fall forward. Fall and say, God, would you help me up? God, I'm going to trust you even when I don't understand. Can you do that? By the way, one of the reasons that people tell me all the time they don't pray the way they should is because they feel like when they mess up, they disappoint God. You can only disappoint somebody if they're surprised by your behavior. When you mess up, God already knew that was going to happen. He's just waiting for you to get on the same page. Some people say, well, I don't want to confess that to God. And I'm like, do you think he didn't know? Do you think when you say, God, I've had a bad attitude, do you think God in heaven's going, really? No, God's saying, finally, I've just been waiting for you to get back on the same page. It's like the prodigal son coming home, right? We come home, and God says, come on, we're going to kill the fatted calf. Let's go, let's go. Next steps, next steps. In Hebrews 10, 39, it says, But we do not belong to those who shrink back and destroyed, but those who have faith and are saved. So how do you not be like those who are shrink back? This thing will never grow. I replanted some palms in my yard. One of the palms, it's four inches out of sprinkler range. And I have watched that palm this week, and I thought, what's going on? And then I ran the sprinklers, and I saw the sprinkler. I said, oh, there it comes. Oh, no. So I had to go out there with a hose and water it. Listen, too many people think, well, I'm just going to come and get fed once a week at church or once a month. I want to encourage you. Spend time in God's word and let his word feed you. Spend time in prayer and let his spirit water your heart with grace, with truth, with wisdom. We need wisdom all the time. Listen, if you're like me, you don't even realize when you say something that you didn't mean to sound the way you said it. But I can tell you, when you pray, sometimes God will go, you know. And so take time to spend time with him, to grow deep. In order to do that, you have to get still. By the way, the world has tried to steal this idea of meditation. The Bible had meditation thousands of years. And it's not the weird, okay? The Bible had meditation. Why? Because God said, be still and know that I am God. When's the last time you got still? When's the last time you just said, God, I want to thank you. And you just started thinking of the things you're thankful for. And allow the Holy Spirit, allow God to fill your heart. You read the Bible and you didn't just rush through it. You said, God, speak to my heart. And you got still as you read his word. That's true spiritual 
meditation. Don't mix it up with what the world calls meditation. We meditate on God's word. We let it fill our hearts. We let it fill our minds. Get still and know he's God. Number two, discover your identity in Christ, not money. You know, kids love fame. That's kind of the number one goal for kids. And part of the reason they love it is because of the money involved. I remember going to Orlando Magic Games and there was some guy who pulled up in a fancy car and people would stop and go, oh, fancy car. Listen to what the Bible says. Believers in humble circumstances ought to take pride in their high position, but the rich should take pride in their humiliation since they will pass away like a wild flower. Now, time out. Why is he having to say this? Because the early church started out with a struggle. And that was they favored wealthy people over poor people. They, they thought that wealthy people had, should have more influence. Now, if you think that has ended, I had somebody tell me just a couple of years ago that their church, they called me and they said, hey, what do you think about this? Our church chose the finance committee by who gives the most to the church. And I went, uh, what? I met with a builder years ago when we were looking at building a church. And I'll never forget, they came to me and met with me. And this is what, when I decided not to use them. They said, listen, pastor, we can make it where people give more in your church. We did a church in Orlando, and we built a little gym for them. And everybody comes in and does a thumbprint. And they can only get in if they give a certain amount of money a month. And if they come in and they haven't given it, they're locked out of the gym. What? I had a mailing company call me and say, Pastor, you want to do a mailing? We can make it so only the wealthy people in your neighborhood get the mailer. And we can avoid those neighborhoods where people don't have the income. So we can help your church to grow. We didn't use that mailing company. This is nothing old and nothing new. It's been going on since the first century. But here's the deal. If you're rich or if you're poor, you may have the same issue. Listen to what it says here. For the sun rises with scorching heat and withers the plant like my palm. Its blossom falls and its beauty is destroyed. In the same way, the rich will fade away even while they go about their business. Listen to this. Blessed is the one who perseveres. This is uh, a Greek word, hupomeno, which means to stay under pressure. dun 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 Dun, 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 under pressure. Dun, 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 dun. You stay under pressure. Under trial, having stood the test, that person will receive the crown of life that the Lord has promised to those who love him. So he says two things. He says, listen, if you're poor, if you're in humble circumstances, thank God for where you're at. And if you're rich, don't be prideful because of where you're at. What's he saying? It's not the money that matters. You can be greedy and poor, and you can be greedy and rich. You can be generous and poor, and you can be generous and rich. It doesn't have to do with the amount. And let me tell you something, Americans. We're the wealthiest people in the world. Steve was talking last night, and he'll talk again next service about going out to the port ministry. And one of the things you realize as you start to talk to those sailors who are working on these ships for hardly anything and sending most of the money home... That we have so much. Even those of us who are at the lowest part. It's like Paul says, I know what's to have plenty and I know what's have to be in want. In all things I can be content. God, I want to be content. Ecclesiastes 5.10 says this, whoever loves money never has enough. Whoever loves wealth is never satisfied with their income. This too is meaningless. By the way, you want to get depressed, read Ecclesiastes. But it's a good book to remind us of what matters. What matters? He, he had started following things that don't matter. That's why the Bible says the love of money is the root of all evil. It doesn't say money's evil. Did you know that? Money's neutral. We decide how we use it and what we focus on. Now, I'll tell you what it's like, though. When you're poor, when you don't have anything, it's amazing how God answers your prayers. I remember years ago when my kids were little, I was working at Quincy's, substitute teaching school, didn't have two nickels to rub together, and we budgeted very carefully for groceries, but one week we ran out of toilet paper. We were down to the last roll. Now, you guys know what that's like because of COVID. 
There was plenty on the shelves. We just couldn't get it. Now you're like, well, Eric, it's just a couple bucks. Yeah. And so I remember praying, Lord, I don't know how, but could you provide toilet paper? Now that is the weirdest prayer I've ever prayed. Actually, I prayed it last year for some people, but the next night, can I tell you what happened? Some of my students that I substituted for came to roll our house and I woke up and went out the door and they dropped 12 rolls of beautiful double ply Charmin toilet paper on my lawn and ran away. Thank you, children. If you've never had those moments where you've seen God answer prayer, even with a student bringing toilet paper to your house, you haven't seen God do a miracle. That's right. That is a miracle. Number three, deal with your desires. Deal with your desires. Hey, did you hear me tell the story? What happens? Your desires. You see something and you want it. Listen to what the Bible says. When tempted, no one should say, God is tempting me. God did not say, McFlurry. For God cannot be tempted by evil, nor does he tempt anyone, but each person is tempted. Listen to this. When they are dragged away by their own evil desire and enticed. See, Satan doesn't even have to try with you because you take the seed and you plant it yourself and then you fertilize it. McFlurry. Oh, that would, I bet you that's delicious. That looked really good when they were eating it. But it's bad for you. Oh, I don't care. It's delicious. Every sin has the same way we do. What happens next? When they're dragged away by their own evil desire and enticed, then after desire's conceived, it gives birth to sin, and sin, when it is full grown, gives birth to death. See, you have a choice to build endurance or to be a baby every time you're tempted. I was going to show a video of some kids crying, but I couldn't take it. They were crying over the littlest things. Sometimes one of the kids was crying because they wanted to have a fever like their sister had. But I couldn't show the video because it bothered me so much. By the way, a baby crying is the worst time to make a decision. It, did you know that? They've actually discovered that it is the worst time to make a decision. You didn't know that, but maybe you do now. Some of us are like those children when God doesn't give us exactly what we want. When we want. <laughs> What's God doing? He's trying to grow us. And when temptation comes, what happens? We plant the seed. And here's the deal. Nobody becomes a crack addict overnight. Nobody becomes an adulterer overnight. Nobody steals money from the IRS. Oh, that goes well. Overnight. Nobody becomes a politician. Oh, I'm sorry. I shouldn't have put that there. All right. So here's the deal. What happens? You know, there was from a very famous uh, 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 pastor who had just came out recently after he died all the stuff he was doing. He didn't wake up one day and make bad choices. What happened? He started making little choices and then made another choice and then he hid that sin. They actually were paying hush money to women to not report what was happening to him for years. So a whole group of people was encouraging him in this sin. And when Ravi Zacharias finally died and all that came out, we were shocked. But God was not. Because what happened? The enemy planted a little seed. Hey, just give in to this. It's not a big deal. Just give in to this. It's not a big deal. Just one meeting. Just one private meeting with a woman. It'll be okay. Just one extra glass of wine. It won't be a big deal. It's just a little pot. You can try it. Whatever it is in your life. Maybe it's just anger. That person doesn't deserve unforgiveness. I, I don't want to forgive them. I don't want to be obedient to God. Whatever the area is, the enemy will try to convince you it's okay. And can I tell you something? When you finally get a hold of that temptation, it is not as good as you thought it was going to be. And that's when the enemy comes to you after telling you it's okay, it's okay, it's okay, and says, that's the worst thing you could ever do. God doesn't even love you anymore. And then we confess our sins. The Bible says he's faithful and just and will forgive us our sin. Listen to what it says in 1 Corinthians 10, 13. No temptation has overtaken you except what is common to man. And God is faithful. He will not let you be tempted beyond what you can bear. But when you're tempted, he will provide a way out so that you can endure it. Every time you make that choice to plant that seed, you have a choice to walk away. 
Now, let me tell you what this looks like at my house. I love my mom. She's watching online right now. My mom will go, and she's done this several times. She will go and buy a glass jar. She's done it a couple times now. And then she'll buy peppermint. She loves peppermint. She will fill it with peppermints. And then she will put it in the living room or on the counter in the kitchen. And I cannot tell you the number of times walking across the house, all of a sudden I realize there is a peppermint in my mouth. I don't even remember grabbing it. But it was right there, so I just threw it in my mouth. Didn't even know how to grab because I love peppermint. And I found that I ate, before I knew it, a half a jar of peppermints in like a day and a half. And I thought, what is wrong with me? This is like Pringles to me. Right? You know what changed everything? I got a dish towel. I covered up the candy. And it changed everything. All of a sudden, I didn't notice it anymore. Can I give you a little secret for those of you trying to lose weight, but you're working from home? Because if you're working from home, you'll do the same thing with food. You'll find food in your mouth. Like, what? did I go in the pantry? I don't remember. Why did I buy Pringles? I should have never bought those. They're not here anymore, but I bought them, right? Chew gum. That's, that's your way of running away. What are you, chewing gum? Because you can't just throw something in your mouth when you got gum in there. So you can get sugar-free gum. It's a little way to what? To resist temptation by what? By backing away from the opportunity. Don't try to get as close as you can to temptation. Hey, how far will God let me go? Ha! Ah! Instead, say, God, God, I want to re- run from temptation. I want to be removed from temptation. Can we learn to dwell on eternity, on the results that God has for us? Can we discover identity in Christ and not our finances? And can we deal with those desires that constantly come and attack us and try to get us to act in ways that are from the flesh and not the spirit? My prayer for us is that we would see God's strength in us and focus on eternity instead of the now and now. If you're here today or watching online and you've never given your life to Christ, you can do that today. John 3.16 says, For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son, that whoever believes, whoever puts their faith, that's like sitting in a chair, whoever puts their faith in him will not perish but have eternal life. You can do that today. You can surrender your life to him. Confess, Lord, I'm a sinner, I'm messed up, I'm broken. Thank you for dying on a cross and rising again. I surrender my life to you. Come into my heart and change me. The Bible says that when you do that, when you pray that prayer, and actually a prayer is just a way of expressing your heart, that the Holy Spirit comes to live in you. Why? So you can live out the Christian life. If you want to do that today, I'd be glad to talk to you after the service. Normally now we have our time of giving and we pass an offering plate, which hopefully by the end of next month we'll be doing again. Woo-hoo! Uh, but in the meantime, you can give online or you can give on your way out. I want to thank you for being here this morning. By the way, we're also planning on having Lord's Supper next month. Uh, so just plan on that ahead. And uh, so we're, we're moving along. So let's go to the Lord in pl- prayer today. Thanks for being here. Thanks for watching online. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your word. Thank you for your truth. Lord, I pray that that we would not be fake because we've spent time with you. And Lord, even though sometimes fruit has dents and bruises and bumps, it's real. And I pray that we could be real in our faith. Lord, I thank you that we're not at a church that's a show and just trying to impress people. But Father, we just try to be real with people and seek you with all our hearts. Father, help us to desire the things you want us to desire and to move away from the things the world wants us to desire. Lord, we trust you and we love you. Lord, thank you for those this morning that are making the next steps with you, whether it's getting saved or whether it's being baptized or whether it's getting to be a part of a small group or taking a 201 class or a membership class. Father, I pray that we could take those next steps and walk in wisdom with you. We thank you for these moments. In Jesus' name, amen.